Hello, and welcome to the backstory on all things water related to Longmont. Water policy, water portfolio, and the future of water in Longmont. My name's Tim Waters, and as a volunteer for Longmont Public Media, I'm your host of the backstory. And the backstory gives you a chance to learn kind of what you might not read in the in the front page of the Times Call or the Longmont Leader or other kind of mainstream media, or even on social media. This is a chance to go deep with experts uh, on the content, uh, on the topics and the content we deal with in, in telling the backstory. And in this backstory, uh, if you had a chance to watch episode one, and if you're watching this as episode two, you might want to watch episode one, because we talked up in the, in the first episode about a number of issues in the lower Colorado Basin, and I'm going to ask our, our experts to highlight that. Today, we're going to focus more on what all of what we talked about last week means for Longmont, both near term and long term. And here are the people you're going to get a chance to, to hear from. Ken Hewson is Longmont's uh, water resources manager. Welcome, Ken. Jeff Drager is director of engineering for Northern Water. Welcome back, Jeff. And Dale Rademacher, deputy city manager, uh, who has oversight of public works and natural resources, which all of our water uh, uh, decisions, policy, and, and future kind of roll up under his, his auspices. And he has shepherded it all really well, you know, for the last however many years, 30 years, Dale, something like that, 38 years. So, um, so we didn't add up all the collective experience in this group, but I know it's probably way, way more than a hundred years of experience uh, among you three gentlemen. So thanks for coming back. Um, anyway, I'm just going to turn to you. Just what are the highlights of the first or episode one uh, that kind of tee up now where we want to go from your perspectives? Anything that 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 resonate for you or that you, you think listeners ought to pay particular attention to in episode one to help make this transition into episode two? Well, for, for me, uh, Tim, I think it was... Um... It was important to sort of get grounded in the, in the in the larger picture of the of the overall Colorado River, and I think uh, Ken and, and Jeff did a great job of sort of providing an overview of what that looks like and addressing issues such as you know what's the likelihood of a compact call, uh, what's the likelihood of a potential reduction of diversions uh, on the on the on the Colorado River and in particular on the Colorado Big Thompson or the Windy Gap project. And so I think it's good for listeners to sort of keep that all in, in, in mind when seeing the current news of the day yeah. that, um, you know, right now is really focused on the lower river in, in the uh, Arizona, Nevada, California uh, areas. And so um, I think today it'll be important to really drill us back into, so what does it look like here in Longmont? Yeah. And uh, so I, I think from that perspective, it, 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 those two gentlemen did a great job. They did. Ken and, and Jeff, anything you want to highlight from last our first episode? Because Dale's kind of teed it up now to move into uh, where do we fall into this big picture? I don't have anything to add. All right. Ken? Ahead, so. oh, I, th I think that was really good. It really summarized the, the real issue of lower Colorado River it does impact us however there's there's a lot of background that you have to yeah. look at to even understand why it impacts us and so I think that first session would be great for people to look at to understand even more so what we're talking about today and long monitors uh, those of you who, who view this that's the whole point right to, to build kind of the background knowledge we need to understand what does that all mean for us and our kids and our grandkids as we go into the future. So think about this, this episode and this two-part series as about really a uh, policy portfolio in the future for Longmont. So uh, you made reference, uh, Dale, to Windy Gap, and, and that's a term that most Longmonters, I, su I suspect, are familiar with. Uh, but, but drill a little bit deeper. Whoever wants to pick this up, on when you say Windy Gap, what are you talking about? So people understand kind of what's the big picture here. Like Jeff, you want to take a lead on that as you, uh, yeah, sure. Further as the operator of the project, sure, I'll give it a try, uh, and, and I'll start maybe with a little bit of history. Your your viewers probably know this, but uh, agriculture developed in the North Front Range in the late 1800s, early 1900s, 
at that time, irrigation ditches and associated reservoirs were constructed to serve those farms. Um, they found out in the 1930s that there really wasn't enough water available to meet the needs of those farms. And so a group of people went to the Bureau of Reclamation. They got the Bureau of Reclamation to build the Colorado Big Thompson Project, which brings a lot of water from the Colorado River over to the North Front Range. So that was the starting point. In the 1960s, there was a lot of growth again happening on the North Front Range. And there were six cities on the North Front Range, Longmont being one of them, that realized that maybe they didn't want to take the CBT water for all this new municipal growth. They wanted to leave some of that for agriculture. So they decided to develop this Windy Gap project, which would divert water from the Colorado River below the CBT project uh, and pump it up into Lake Granby and have that water delivered into um, delivered to the same customers that, that CBT water is delivered to through the Colorado Big Thompson infrastructure. So it was a pretty clever project. It was really developed uh, in 1967, I think when the Longmont mayor filed for a water right for the Windy Gap project. So, you know, I was an eight year old kid in Longmont at the time. I was not aware that that was going on. So uh, didn't know that was happening. I, uh, but as you mentioned, people in Longmont do know that Windy, what Windy Gap is because my sister tells me it's on her tax bill every year. So she's, she's aware of, of the project as it's, as it's ongoing. So the project was, was built and constructed from 1981 to 1985. It's a pump station on the Colorado River with a small reservoir. It pumps water that's on the Colorado River below Granby Dam. Really, it's pumping Fraser River water, essentially, up into Granby Reservoir, and then that water is delivered through the CBT system. Through the pumping system and the tunnel, right, or pipeline yeah, that you've got. Yeah, the existing. Yeah. So they built this small reservoir. They built a big pump station with a nine-foot diameter pipe to take the water up into Lake Granby, and from there it comes through the existing system that the Bureau of Reclamation built. It's a very interesting project. I think they thought at the time that they could deliver about 48,000 acre feet through this project, assuming they built their own storage. Uh, they've never delivered that amount of water uh, for, for a couple of different reasons. Um, uh, the project now uses existing CBT storage and tries to make use of the CBT storage. At one time, they thought they were gonna build their reservoir on the West Slope. I think they eliminated it from the project for cost reasons back in the 1970s. Uh, and never built that reservoir, but I think they always knew they needed to build a new reservoir. That has worked at times, but other times it has not worked very well. So when the Colorado Big Thompson project, Lake Granby fills with their original Colorado Big Thompson water, there's no room for Windy Gap water. Uh, we can't take the Windy Gap water, even though we're in priority, and that reduces the reliability of the Windy Gap project. And that brought us to this idea of making the Windy Gap project more reliable, which ultimately after we went through years of environmental studies and, and other engineering work, uh, focused on Chimney Hollow Reservoir. That's what we are constructing right now. We received the permits and we're moving forward with that reservoir right now. So, so we're gonna drill down um, on Chimney Hollow in just a minute. So, um, but just to, to make certain from the layman's perspective, uh, we could be reserving, firming, uh, uh, more water, storing more water uh, that we have rights to. We just don't have the capacity to store it. And that's where the, we get to Chimney Hollows. We have a couple of other sources of water in Longmont. Uh, Ken or Dale, talk to us a bit about Button Rock, Ralph Price uh, Reservoir, or the dam and, and, um, and the reservoir behind it, where that water comes from and what it means to Longmont, both short-term and long-term. Great, yes. Um... The city of Longmont is very lucky. We have a, a very robust um, water supply. Um, our current plan and, and our policy is to obtain about two thirds of our water supply on, on our native basin, the St. Vrain Creek Basin, about one third from the West Slope. Um, that's, that's how we get our different water supply portfolio. Um, Longmont's primary uh, water supply reservoir, and, and it's normally used in winter um, during low flows, but our primary water supply reservoir is impounded by Button Rock Dam, uh, all, and the reservoir is Ralph Price Reservoir, um, na named for former Mayor Ralph Price, um, 
who was in office when we started construction of that project and really helped move that project forward. That's a 16,000 acre foot reservoir on the main stem of the North St. Vrain Creek, approximately eight miles west of Lyons. The couple of good things about that is that a lot of all the water out of there, most all of the water comes out of Rocky Mountain National Park. So Longmont's extremely fortunate to have some of the highest quality source water to start our entire storage and then ultimately our, our treatment and delivery um, processes. So we have a really great um, uh, source of water. And then we have uh, a really decent um, storage vessel in, in Button Rock Dam. We also, Longmont also has um, a number of original filings. We have one filing that goes clear back to 1882. Um, when Longmont first developed uh, its very first water system. Uh, that's a direct flow water right to deliver water to our system, as well as a number of subsequent um, filings, uh, direct flow filings, which we use in our system. Um, the unfortunate part, part about all that is, um, you know, Longmont, we're, we're now having our 150th anniversary. Um, you know, Longmont was formed in 1871 and for a good portion of the summer, um, the water rights that are, the more senior your water right, the more water you're, you're able to have during lower flow time periods, especially mid to late summer when the, when the snow melt is done, there's less stream flow. So during the summer, it's very common that no water right um, senior to 1870 is in priority in our basin. And usually it's no water right senior or junior to uh, 1865. So you, we're working on, on just a very small margin of, of water rights that are in uh, later in the summer than, than during the winter time period. So that's what the, the, the value of the storage that we have on our side. Longmont has, in addition to Ralph Price, um, we own McCall Lake, which is between Longmont and Lyons. We also own... Uh, shares in a pri couple private reservoirs, a number of private reservoirs such as Lake McIntosh. Um, we own a little over about two thirds of that re reservoir. And we also own about 85% of Union Reservoir located just east of Longmont. All of those reservoirs work together to supply Longmont. It's, it's uh, both summer, late summer and winter water supplies, as well as all the direct flow decrees. Um, we also have a very robust and well thought out um, water dedication policy. When new land comes into the city of Longmont to be developed, we require the water that is historical to that property to be dedicated to the city um, for service to that property. So the very water right that was irrigating crops prior to annexation of the land will now be used to, to um, provide water service to the developed portion. Um, that's also served Longmont very well, and especially because a lot of the water rights that um, irrigate the land around Longmont are the most senior water rights in the basin. Um, basically, when this area was developed, settled in the early 1860s and grew, it grew, it settled in the Longmont area and grew out from there. So we have some of the most senior water rights in the basin, which, which is very, very advantageous to us, especially during periods of drought where we, some of our water rights won't get called out, whereas other water rights are. So that's really a, a very, the very portfolio that we have, how we get our water um, and why the, the West Slope water is especially important because it provides us one, a secondary source of water you know, sometimes it's dry on this side, wet on the west side. Um, generally, bigger droughts tend to cover all of Colorado, but, but uh, it, it is possible to, to have more water on one side or the other. But it also gives us a second source of water, a kind of resiliency in our system that, that is really an envy of many people because many, many water providers only have one water source. So, um, so having the dual water sources. So God bless. 
Ralph Price and our predecessors that they had the vision to do and the and the courage to do this. I'm certain it took when they made those decisions. Uh, it took some political will uh, to make those commitments. Number one. Uh, number two. Um, every time I listen to you, I learn something, and I've I've heard you a number of times. But every time there's 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 deeper insight. So I appreciate what you what, how you kind of put together that part of the portfolio. I know there's more to talk about in terms of the portfolio when we get to Chimney Hollows. Um, just a bit of a commercial here, uh, unrelated to water rights, but, un, but related to water quality. Um, I, I, we have a, a team putting together a management plan for, button, for uh, Ralph Price Reservoir um, uh, that has to do with numbers of visitors and dogs on leashes and people cleaning up after themselves and a variety of issues that for some people may be controversial um, but I hope listeners will understand that, that you made a comment about the quality of that water that comes out of Rocky Mountain National Park. We are so fortunate. It gets treated, certainly, when it gets into our water treatment system. But maintaining the quality of that water before it gets to the treatment system is, is as important as what happens when it gets here. And so we're very mindful of what, what might wash into the water in, in Ralph Price Reservoir before it goes through Button Rock Dam on its way to our water treatment facility. Fair? Yeah. Yes. So when we- if I, could, if I could jump in there, just yeah. this year, you know, the Cameron Peak fire up in Fort yes. Collins, up west of Fort Collins is causing those same issues. And Fort Collins and Greeley are taking their water out of Horsetooth Reservoir or most of their water because of water quality issues because of the fire. So even though there's enough water, the quality is important now. So long monitors? Think about that when you, when you hear more about this management plan and, and you want to walk your dogs off leash and they don't get cleaned up after. Not that you would do that, but some people do. So um, we're very, very concerned about what, what washes in to Ralph Price Reservoir. Um, so let's now talk about the rest of the story in terms of the portfolio. Uh, Jeff, Jeff made a comment um, a little bit ago. Uh, that we are now underway constructing Chimney Hollows Reservoir. Uh, as I recall, it was on the ballot in 2017 that Longmonters approved um, uh, uh, servicing debt, selling bonds to be able to participate in the Chimney Hollows firming project. That was the, the language, language that was used. So, Dale, do you want to pick it up? I, I, the first time I really learned about this, I'm sitting in the city council chamber and I'm watching Dale Rademacher make a presentation on, uh, there was a proposal, there was a fair amount of science, not, not a, a lot of science behind that proposal and the estimates of what, what Longmont would need, even given what we knew then about climate change. So right. just bring us up today. What got started on August 6th, there was a groundbreaking. Why the lag between 2017 and August 6th? People ought to know that. And then kind of where are we in terms of our participation and what's the timeline look like? And what does it do for our overall portfolio as Chimney Hollows comes online? Sure. And, um, you know, back in, uh, even before uh, 2017, there was a lot of work going on. Yeah. Uh, both, both by Northern Water in uh, pursuing uh, the project itself and certainly by the city in um, uh, completing and then updating our uh, raw water master planning. And that's a, that's a fairly time intensive and um, um, rigorous analysis of, of the city's water supply. Uh, Ken has always headed that up. And so when he starts shaking his head, I'll know when I'm uh, uh, going too far. But you know, the purpose of the raw water plan is to not just look at our water supply today, but to look at it into the future and to look at it uh, in several, several different lenses. Uh, one being uh, a growing city, a city that uh, will not be the same population as it is today as we approach 100,000, um, but certainly going uh, beyond that, um, uh, certainly in, into the range of 120, 125,000, if not more, uh, because right now, you know, the city is looking at densifying the city uh, for a number of reasons uh, to meet a variety of city objectives. And so, our, our charge, our challenge is to make sure that we have a water supply uh, to be able to serve that, that vision of the community and the council. And so we, we updated that document. And what it showed us then was that um, um, uh, all things considered equal, 
we would need um, around uh, 6,000 or so acre feet of storage space in the, in the Windy Gap um, Chimney Hollow project. Um, that changed uh, a bit when Envision uh, uh, Longmont was completed, um, where, wherein some of that densification was, was sort of brought into the picture. And so the analysis that we then went into was to look at what, what would the additional uh, water demand be associated with those uh, additional residents, right? That additional densification. What that showed us was that, um, you know, 6,000 to 6,500 acre feet would, would probably still get us by. Other things that are considered obviously are things like climate change, drought, um, uh, the general water, water policies of the city, uh, you know, things like continuing with the raw water um, uh, policy and requiring water to come in with new development and so on. Um, so at the time, uh, the Longmont Water Board, their charge is to, is to look very closely at the water supply needs of the city. The Water Board at the time, um, their recommendation to the council was to be around 10,000 acre feet of water. And that is what um, was taken to the voters back in 2017, was a, uh, a proposal to uh, participate in the project up to that 10,000 acre foot level. Um, and it was about a $36 million bond issuance. It, it passed with, with actually pretty, pretty hefty support. You know, Longmont, Longmont residents and, and community members have historically um, stepped up to the plate to uh, make sure that they continue to enjoy, uh, uh, you know, clean, reliable water. And so um, the council um, that came into office, and it was either 17 or 18, modified that, that uh, a commitment level to about 8,000 acre feet. And so uh, I'm sure Jeff and folks at Northern were wondering, well, Longmont, are you ever going to decide your, your participation level? Um, but we take it serious down here and, and we involve the community, we involve the council in making those determinations. Um, the last, what I call it, sort of a tweak in our participation amount was to, was to arrive at about 7,500 acre feet of, of participation level. A lot of that was driven by the economics of the project and some of the cost increases that we were experiencing at the time. So Longmont approached it from many angles, um, one of them being um, affordability and what could we afford uh, with our current rate structure as well as our current capital program. And I think we've arrived at the, at the right level um, we believe as uh, staff that it is sufficient to meet uh, the needs of the city. Um, I believe um, out to the build out of the city as we currently anticipate it, right? That too can change. Uh, I, I, I don't have the, that perfect crystal ball to know what, what, what are future leaders of the community gonna want in the next 20 to 30 years. And so, um, as everything stands now, uh, participation at this level, um, we believe our analysis uh, tells us will provide the city with an adequate water supply um, to serve that, that population up, up into that 120,000 range. Um, so Ken, you can correct me now on anything I may have gotten wrong because you're much closer to the, the information than I am. No, that was that was an excellent summary. I, I really think it'll be valuable to, to people. Um, the only thing I would add is that um, this does quickly devolve into some pretty technical numbers and, and evaluations. Mm -hmm. And anybody who wants to go beyond, you know, the excellent presentation Dale gave us, feel free to go to the City of Longmont's website and just search for future water demand evaluation. And we have the entire study on our website, all the numbers you'll ever want to back up everything we've talked about and get additional information. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. <clears throat> uh, as I understand Envision Longmont, 
uh, my recollection is that the, the, the projected population at the time it was developed was 116,000. And then with more Correct. diversification or more density, it might get to 125 or 30, you know, but it's in that range. But You're the right. water supply is sufficient for that range, um, which we I think that, is, yes. yeah, is for and, even, and, yeah. Go ahead. There's a lot of variability. Uh, you know, water supply um, is, is the one area of engineering that is um, really at the whim of Mother Nature. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in this case, um, what we know and understand about climate change um, is also an evolving science and then an evolving body of information. Uh, we believe that we have sufficient, uh, uh, I call it factor of safety, uh, built into our planning efforts. Uh, so as to get us through that, uh, if we were to experience some of the, the more uh, uh, sort of dire predictions of what yeah. may uh, impact us from climate change. I, I think the other thing to say though, too, is that um, Longmont, community members in, in, in my time have also been incredibly responsible. When asked to cut back or reduce their water use, they, they have come through with uh, you know five-star rating. They have always responded and, and, and um, come to the table again to say, you know what? We acknowledge we're living in the great American desert and there may be times where we need to, uh, again, um, cut back. And, and that's why water conservation is now and always will be um, critical to the long-term sustainability of this community and, and probably also its environmental health. Um, because that, to the, to the extent we're able to not divert the water into the city, into taps, um, we're able to have it be, um, be used for other uses, whether it be recreation or uh, environmental needs and those kinds of things. And yeah. so I think going forward, Longmont's going to be in an excellent position to be able to address a wide range of water, both opportunities and obligations in the coming years. Part of that is a part of that not so subtle message to, to not interpret any of this in terms of supply, right. to misinterpret that as, gee, you, you, could, you just have free reign to do whatever, right. where we still have to conserve. And in, in we talked last in this first episode um, th that we are actually, there is conservation underway right now. We yes. see per capita use dropping over the last number of years, which is a good thing. Yeah. And, uh, and we anticipate continuing to see that. I know the city is doing a number of things to help residents in their conservation efforts from uh, audits of their homes and businesses to providing um, efficient fixtures. There's a whole, whole collection of things that the city does once the, once the water starts to flow uh, to make best use of it. Um, I, I think um, I want to, I want to, I don't want to miss uh, the, the, the opportunity to reinforce what, what Ken said about uh, an, land annexed into the city brings with it, the city has been absolutely clear and consistent about expecting the water rights, traditional water rights to go with that land. So when people are concerned about whether or not land that's annexed and that what it might mean in terms of growth, whether or not it's paying its way, in this case, it does bring water. We're not gonna annex land and develop land where there's not water to support that annexation and development. Is that clear? Is that uh, consistent or accurate? Yeah. Yes. Number two, um, uh, Dale, you mentioned, I think it was in the, that it was the November 17th ballot when the voters approved um, uh, selling those bonds. And part of the way we're servicing the debt on those bonds is with water rates. Correct. And I think the city is anticipating we're now, I think, moving to the, into the third year of a three-year rate increase. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? It's a multi-year rate increase. And I know the first two years were 9% uh, increases. And I believe now going into the 2022 year budget, it's, it's anticipated to be about a 7% yeah. increase. Uh, 23, I believe, steps down again. 
yeah. maybe into the 5% range increase. But um, we, we did look at a multi-year plan, which we always try to do. Uh, and I think in this case, it was a five-year uh, rate plan for water. Um, you know, I'd love to be able to sit here and say, uh, we would, we will never need another rate increase. I, I would love to be able to say that. Yeah. I, I, uh, I am not sure if that's a true statement though, nor should it be a, uh, a reasonable expectation. Um, like most things in our world, um, things continue to get more expensive. Um, right now we are dealing with, uh, significant increases in, in commodities like uh, water pipeline. Um, upwards of 100% increase in the price of pipelines uh, uh, to, to get water pipe, along with delivery delays. And so, you know, the economy right now, I believe is still recovering, resetting itself, if you will, uh, post pandemic. Of course, I don't know if I should say post-pandemic. I, <laughs> I think we're still in the yeah. middle of it, but yeah. uh, um, we are experiencing that. And um, so on the one hand, we can't control that. We also know we need to keep renewing this water system. We cannot ignore it. We cannot let it simply deteriorate um, or uh, the community will not have a safe and reliable supply of water. And so it is a difficult situation. And I know, um, I'm sure many of the folks listening uh, today are, are wondering how they're gonna pay those utility bills going forward. Um, and so um, I know council, you, you have made it a strong priority for us also to provide um, robust programs to, uh, to assist those in the community who are um, challenged due to their income uh, to be able to afford and pay these uh, utility costs. And so it's, it's a complicated mix of ensuring reliability, ensuring high quality, and, and then also ensuring affordability. And uh, that challenge will never end. So it, it will continue. So just to, to do my summary of that, uh, voters approved in 2017 exactly the plan that's now being implemented. Yes. And as difficult as it, it is for folks, the, the rate increases were part of that plan. That was what was presented, yes. laid out at the time. They're, they're increasing, but they're increasing at a, at a, a slower rate now yep. as we move through 2023. Um, but it is the whole objective, both that and the inv investments that we're making in infrastructure to maintain the asset um, is what residents would expect of city leaders to ensure the viability, the sustainability, the quality of the system uh, for generations to come, right? And that, Correct. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little bit like, uh, how do you swallow an elephant or eat an elephant, right? You gotta do it a bite at a time. And that's kind of what we're doing because what we don't wanna have to do is swallow a whole elephant at one time because we failed, right, to pay attention to what, what those needs and those costs were going to be uh, going forward. Um, what's the, we broke ground on August 6th on Chimney Hollows. What's the anticipated uh, time when we get a chance to go and do the ribbon cutting or whatever, whatever you do when a, when a, when a dam's completed? Uh, it's a, Chimney Hollow Reservoir is a four-year construction process. So it'll take four years to build the dam. So sometime in, uh, 2025, we think we'll be complete with building the reservoir. We can start filling it with water at that time. Uh, we think it'll take probably several years to fill the reservoir, depending on the hydrology and, and what's going on. So uh, it's, it's a little ways out there before that reservoir is entirely full, but it, it does, so it does take some time. Yeah. And, and that in that filling the reservoir is really based on rain, uh, rainfall on the West Slope, right? I mean, it's in the yes. wet years that there's, there, there are, is an abundance of water that you can, that you can pump into chimney hollows um, without shorting anybody else downstream what their, what their allotment is. Right, yeah. yes. And, and uh, Jeff, is it, is it correct that in any given year we can divert, um, what's the maximum amount that we can divert through Windy Gap in any given year? 
the maximum amount is 90,000 acre feet, which is actually the size of Chimney Hollow Reservoir. There you go. <laughs> we've, we've never brought that much through the Adams Tunnel, but we've brought, uh, we pumped 60,000. We brought probably 40 plus thousand through in a given year, but we could bring more. I mean, it, the reservoir could fill quicker uh, yeah. than, than three years, uh, depending on the hydrology and the situation in the Colorado Big Thompson project. We need all Coloradoans to be doing rain dances of some kind yes. right, to, to generate more moisture on both both east and west slopes. Um, but the, but the 90,000 acre feet, we will own or, or will have paid for 7,500 of those 90,000 acre feet and have water supply given the unknowns about climate change to service a city of 125,000 plus if we if build out takes us beyond 125,000. Gentlemen, uh, I hope I hope uh, we get a lot of viewers on this program because it's a, a wealth of information that people honestly this there won't be many opportunities maybe ever to get you three in a conversation like this for this period of time to help bring people the public along with an understanding of what are the policies? What's the portfolio? And what's the future of Longmont or of, of water in Longmont? So, uh, thank you again for what you do every day. Uh, the, the the community is indebted to you, your decades of service, your expertise. Thank you for the time you've dedicated to to these two segments. And Longmonters, that's your backstory on everything water related in Longmont, Colorado. Thanks, Thanks gentlemen. Thank you.